everybody, I am Jarrett Ross, the Genie Vlogger, and I am here back at the Reclaim the Records booth with another amazing member of the team. Can you please introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Alec Ferretti, and I am a dual master student at NYU and LIU. I live in New York City, and I am a big fr fan of Brooke Gantz. We, um, I only met her about two years ago, three years ago, after she'd already started Reclaim the Records, but I'd seen her on social media, and I realized that she had found an amazing loophole that allowed all of us to get records that we needed. So I actually began oof, about three years ago, I modeled my request off of what she had done, and I requested my hometown's marriage index. And sure enough, for one dollar, they were able to give me an Excel spreadsheet that they created of the 1958 to 2016 or so marriage records. And it was great. Wonderful. Now, can you tell us a little bit about the process that you go through when you're looking for the records that you want to fight for or just identifying. Sure. Yeah. So this actually, I, I have a good story because this is kind of how I became officially involved in Reclaim the Records as opposed to just a fan on the sidelines. Perfect. So about two years ago, a friend of my cousin needed help finding her birth mother. And sure enough, she was one of the new adoptees in New Jersey who had recently gotten her original birth certificate. So she knew that she was born in the 60s to this unwed mother in Newark. We have her maiden name as of 1968. We didn't know what happened to her. So I went to see, well, where can I find the marriage records? Because presumably she would have given up this baby, then gotten married within one to 10 years. As it turned out, there were no marriage indexes for New Jersey at all. Not for the 60s, not for the 2000s, not for the early 1900s. Um, the New Jersey State Archives did have some copies on deposit of, of records, but they were only available there not to the archives' fault, I will explicitly clarify, they were required by the Department of Health to not release these copies to anybody unless you were there in person, because they were not actually the custody of the state archives. That's an important plug. Very interesting. <laughs> yes. So the Department of Health only gave it to them on that. So anyway, I was trying to figure out how can we circumvent this in the Brookgan style. So I went through the New Jersey Vital Records statutes. And there was a wonderful line of text that, as I later learned, had been there since the 1880s, at least, that said, a marriage index is a public record. So despite the fact that no marriage index had ever been released or given to the archives free and clear, a law that's been on the books for over 120 years actually said that all marriage indexes were public. I'd spoken to people from New Jersey who'd said that years ago they'd been able to go there and journalists had gone to the Department of Health and actually had seen these indexes. At some point in the past 20 years, actually, no, after 9-11. Okay. So, allegedly, the terrorists who hijacked the planes got fraudulent documents through New Jersey. And that's what caused the crackdown. Interesting. So the laws apparently weren't changed necessarily, but the government, you know, the Department of Health took it upon themselves to stop how they did things. But they never changed the law. So I filed an Open Public Records Act request. Now, the Open Public Records Act is the version of their Freedom of Information law. Every state has a different law. They're all about the same. Typically, it says that you can request any public record from the government. They will reproduce it for you at cost. Uh, you, this doesn't apply to records that are explicitly mentioned in the rule as not being allowed. But if the law doesn't preclude a certain set of records and it's a public record, this law will make the state make you the record. They're all a little bit different, but... That's, that's roughly how any state would be. So I filed an OPRA request with New Jersey, and they promptly denied it. Of course. So then as every state continues, there's always an appeals process. And every state's different. New York is actually great in the sense that, you know, New York has a committee on open government. So they don't actually have an official appeals process. You just appeal to the same person that denied you, or the same agency. But there's actually this committee that has had the ability to write non-binding decisions, but there's an office of full-time attorneys that are staffed to help you. Jersey's a bit different. There's actually a special counsel that handles the appeals. And they're super backlogged and super understaffed, but when you appeal, it actually is appealed explicitly to public records attorneys who look at the case much more objectively than the agency themselves would. So I started this process. We were actually in the process of setting up hearings. Brooke was going to help me, and we were going to have calls with the attorneys. Eventually, I got a call from the assistant attorney general who'd stepped in. Basically, she realized that they were completely wrong, and she apologized and overnighted me on a flash drive, everything I'd asked for. So they sent me 117 years of marriage indexes, scanned PDFs or databases, depending on the year, for free. 
so I was good to go. So, you know, this doesn't apply for all types of records because a lot of records aren't public for various reasons or aren't covered under FOIL or whatever their public records are. So this is the case with a lot of court records. So in New York specifically, FOIL excludes court records. So people often say, oh, I'm going to get this will via FOIL. Well, you can't. So you have to understand what your state law is regarding public records and the state law regarding the actual records you want. So there's vital statistics statutes and there's vital statistics regulations. The statute is a law that's created by the legislature. The regulation is a rule created by the agency. A rule cannot override a law, so we have to figure out how the rules and the laws all interplay with each other. So can you give us a, a bit of insight into some of the projects that you're currently working on at Reclaim the Records and some of the things that you're looking into? Yeah. So I um, sometimes when, I'm, when I can't sleep and I, I get very philosophical about if I'm doing the wrong thing. You know, if, if I'm any identity thefts in Nigeria, and I, I like to think a lot about what we're doing. And you know, I'm, as we're all genealogists, we all want public records. But I do like to be responsible. I like to think a lot about why the records we're making public are public to begin with. So you know, there's a lot of controversy about marriage records. And right now, we are in a lawsuit with New York State where we want the 1968 or so to the present marriage index. There's a Supreme Court, a state Supreme Court decision from the 90s that said the indexes are all public. However, the state is claiming that because of the scary risk of identity theft, it can't be released. So even though there's this court decision saying marriage indexes are all public from all years, they're claiming the exemption that because there's an, an, it's putting an undue, unnecessary risk to the public, which we don't really believe. I don't believe that's the case. All a marriage index says is the name, the date, and the place. So other than the fact that Alec Ferretti might have gotten married in this year in this township, it doesn't tell us anything. And furthermore, I actually think the marriage records should be public. Not only is the fact that I was married in a catering hall somewhere in Suffolk County in 2002, that it's not a big deal. But even that aside, marriage historically, traditionally, currently, is a public institution. In fact, we subsidize marriage. And the government has said to married couples, we want you to get married, we're going to let you spend less money on your taxes. I'm actually not married. I am subsidizing all the married people. I think I have a right to know who they are and where they are. And you know, traditionally, at least in the Christian faiths, marriage bans were put on the church door. So for much of history, marriages either happened in a church where they were public to all, or literally affixed to the wall of the city hall or the church saying these people are getting married. In Italy, if I go on town websites, they will still post the ban saying that Giuseppe and Nunziata are getting married next Thursday. So I think there's a lot of precedent to believe that marriage records are explicitly in the public interest. And you can make the same arguments for death records and a little bit less so for birth records, but each record has their own reasons why the public has a right to know. So what we've been doing is for our New York lawsuit, our attorney asked us to compile some data about what the other states' marriage laws are like. And I decided to not leave my house for a weekend. <laughs> and I made a really, really unwieldy spreadsheet where I went through all 50 states and I compiled the status of their marriage laws. So I went through the year that they become centralized, what the statute says about when they become public, what the statute says about when the index becomes public, what is actually being made public in practice, what's online, and any miscellaneous notes. We had to file this in court with Albany, and we're going to put it online in some sort of searchable format as soon as it gets finished and polished and pretty enough. But in the meantime, we have this big internal working document where we have these notes about where there are all these discrepancies. Where is there a law that says the index is released after a certain period of time, when in reality it's not being released? One of the projects we want to work on this year is Wisconsin. Sure enough, the Wisconsin Vital Records Statute is very, very clear. It says that the indexes to marriages, de deaths, divorces, annulments, civil partnerships, and civil partnership annulments all become public after two years. So anything 2017 and prior for all those events, everything except for a birth, is public almost immediately. The two years we don't really care about. But 2017 and earlier is all public. And according to the website, you can go to Madison between the hours of 9 and 12 on weekdays and look at the books. Except that's not how public records laws works. As long as we're paying for the copies, we should be able to get our own copies to put them online. Now, Wisconsin has different laws. We have to get an attorney and really understand this a little bit more in depth. But 
from our knowledge of how these laws and institutions are made, it should all be fine. So that is one of our projects that we're going to work on. So really the trick is to figure out where there's a statute that makes something public and when it's not public, and then to work from it. When the statute itself makes things private, we want to know about it, we can discuss it, we can advocate. But if the law says that these records are not public, it's a lot harder for us because we can't sue anybody. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for thank meeting you. with us and um, good thank luck you. with everything that you're doing. Great. I know we're all rooting for you. I uh, hope we have some more luck. Awesome, awesome. For anyone who hasn't checked out Reclaim the Records, be sure to check them out. Uh, you can Google them, or I believe there's also a website that they can go to. Yeah, reclaimtherecords.org. All right, real easy to find out. So be sure to check them out. Uh, send a donation if you believe in this same stuff, which I think anyone in genealogy really does. We so, are now uh, having t-shirts available for a donation. So if you want to get a, a t-shirt, I believe it's a $30, $30 donation. dollars donation. So, I mean, $30, you get a t-shirt, and you get to help bring documents to the public. 